I think all kids are curious. I'm always thinking of things and having a piece of paper in my pocket and pencils and pens, I can jot down ideas and then explore them later on when I got more time. That is his trademark. During the day, he's always thinking of something and he thinks, well, I better write it down. So he takes out his pad of paper. Once it's written there, then he, he feels comfortable. I grew up outside of Rochester, New York, and my mother was from Olean, New York, about 100 miles south. My cousin had a friend who was very much interested in chemistry. So we would go to visit Olean, and I would go with him, and that really got me started, probably around the age eight years old, let's say. When my parents found out I was interested in chemistry, they bought me a chemistry set, a Gilbert chemistry set as a Christmas present. I think I fell in love with science as answering so many questions and explaining how the world around you works. And, and it gives you a sense of confidence the more you understand that. This face, like I would say, is him. This is where he comes whenever he wants to tinker with anything. This is like where he goes when he wants to just be himself. And I think like whenever anything comes up in his life that like isn't working specifically, he'll try to fix it in here. Like if the hose is leaking, he'll bring it down. And so it's just important for him to have a space that's fully his to create whatever he wants. I knew that anytime I had like a project growing up, I could always ask him for help. In like high school and I had senior year, I had projects where I needed like chicken wire and pliers and I was using some of his wires to make sculptures and so it was always just fun to know that there's like a place with like infinite things that you could make whatever you want. An organized mess. So to any stranger, like you would be like, wow, what is going on here? But he has like a couple hundred ongoing projects in there. He knows where everything is. I would describe the basement as an organized disaster. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's messy, but I used to say, you don't have to die to go to heaven. You just have to create it for yourself. I created my own heaven in that downstairs area, and I love being down there. He has his machine shop, his computer lab, his wood shop. He has all his journals, so he's able to take his ideas downstairs and play with them. But he's always tinkering around. Even though I think it's a mess, he knows where everything is. It's his happy place. Over the years, I've purchased lots of components. One of the things I accumulated was the South Bend metal lathe. <laughs> you load it up, you turn it on, and you stand back and watch that lathe run for maybe five minutes cutting that thread. Now, this is what a tool should be. The human just starts it and then the tool takes over and finishes the job. And that's what the computer represents to me today. My uncle went into the Navy and he came back at the end of World War II and went to the University of Rochester to become a chemical engineer. Well, when he found out I was interested in chemistry, he gave me some of his high school and then later college chemistry books when he no longer needed them. So I was probably about nine or 10 years old and I'm reading college level chemistry books. At one point, he gave me a subscription to Popular Science magazine. I saw an ad from a New York City surplus house for a five inch cathode ray tube. And I built myself a crude oscilloscope and that got me started in electronics. My father worked for a railway signal company in Rochester. He knew the fellow who was the head of the electronics department there. And so I ended up upon graduating from high school, working at that railway signal company. One of the members of the board was also connected with Rensselaer and offered a scholarship to children 
of the employees of the company, and I won one of those scholarships. I had the money to go to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. As a senior at Rensselaer, I applied for and was awarded a National Science Foundation Fellowship to go to graduate school, and so I chose Stanford. I was a postdoc for maybe six years. The professor I was working with, Bernie Woodrow, felt that to do our work in neural networks, we needed some way to model them, and one way would be to have a computer and simulate them. He managed to get an IBM 1620, which was the first computer I got to work with. But then I was approached by a fellow named Bob Noyce, who had been the head of Fairchild Semiconductor. And he told me on the phone he was starting a new company, which became Intel, and would I be interested in applying for a position. So anyway, I ended up being employee number 12 at Intel. My parents found a shortwave radio kit offered by Allied Radio. This is about the time when there was a lot of suspicion about the Soviet Union in the post-war era, and yet on occasion, I managed to pick up shortwave broadcasts in English from Radio Moscow. <laughs> yeah, he's, well, he's the mad scientist. He's honestly just like a little kid and he just gets excited about making things blow up. <laughs> he's amazing. I mean, he's always thinking and always trying to figure things out. He always is trying to find a better way for something. If something breaks in our house, you know, most people will call a service person, we call Ted, and he's right there and he figures it out. His thinking, I mean, and it's 24 seven. I mean, even when we're at home at night watching television, out comes the paper and pen. He's, he's just thinking all the time and then with his thoughts, then he goes down to the basement and that's when he does his tinkering. How his mind works, I couldn't tell you, but it's always working. At Intel, we were developing a new kind of memory. And our first customer was a Japanese calculator company. And because of my background with computers and so on, I got chosen to be the liaison. I went to Bob Noyce and I said, I think we may have bitten off more than we can chew here. In other words, they had a lot of chips. Uh, for example, in their calculator, they had a chip just to deal with the keyboard input. If we had a simple little processor, we could do all of those functions, like the keyboard debouncing, and the display control and the printer control, all would become programs. We could make a processor that had very simple instructions and execute enough of them fast enough to do the more complicated operations that needed to be done in the calculator. And the management of the calculator company said, we like the Intel design. And so at that point, we became committed to build what would become the first microprocessor. There have been electronic flea markets in this area for years and years, and I've been to many of them. And oft times there will be circuit boards that'll have interesting components on them. And I think I have something like 25 boxes each box probably has a couple dozen boards in it. And so if I'm looking for a part, I just go to the spreadsheet and say, which box do I go to or which drawer do I go to to find the part? Over the years, any, anything that's broken or needs to be fixed, we say, Papa can fix it. He won't give up until it's, <laughs> until it's fixed, like no matter what it is. Papa can fix it, Papa can fix it. Give him anything, he'll find a solution. They see that here is somebody 
that you can bring something broken to and they can make it whole again. To know that it's possible, it can be done, and if I can do it, they can do it too. I think that it's very valuable seeing what he's done and how big of an impact he's had in the community and it really does inspire me to want to try and make something equally as great or try and contribute to the world in as powerful as a way as he's done. He loves working with young people at the Inventors Hall of Fame when he does the judging. He adores listening to their ideas and after they email him, how can I make this better or that better? And he loves working with them to show them a better way. One of the things that I like about computing and computers, this seemed to be an area where women started to get involved, first as programmers and then expanding beyond that into more into the design. But that seemed to open up the field of electronics and computing for women. And the idea that I have a granddaughter that's going into engineering is very satisfying. <laughs> I think from the time they couldn't even walk and they were babies, we have thousands of Legos and building things and he would just be on the floor with them building bridges and if they fell he'd say well it doesn't have enough support so how do we give it more support so it'll be more stable he was always teaching them when they had school projects he was always there he's papa to me but i try to take a moment every once in a while and just like zoom out and be like wow like this man in front of me has changed the world the biggest impact that he's had on me and like what I've learned the most from him is that one man, one person really can make an impact and change the world. And any time that I am discouraged about the system, whatever is going on in the world, I just remember that I can make a difference and Papa showed me that. Um, and he's inspired me, he's inspired all of us. To pursue invention is to keep your eyes open, looking for opportunities, from following curiosity, it leads you in the right direction. If ever anyone, any one of us, needs him for anything, he has always just risen to the occasion and supported any one of us. He's just a role model that you would think he'd be busy, and I know we're so proud of what Ted has done to help the world and with his accomplishments, but if you knew the accomplishments, what he has done for our family, never even cares if he gets credit. He really doesn't. He is just there doing what needs to be done. You know, we're here on Earth for a given amount of time, and then eventually we're going to go away. What do we leave behind us? Yes, you can leave inventions, and that's one thing. But the other thing is our family. They carry on, hopefully, our values, our hopes, our dreams. And if we can convey that to our children and grandchildren, and they continue that on, that seems to me even better than what we ourselves accomplish alone during a lifetime. <laughs>